on this episode of Civic Cocktail. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> New Mayor Jenny Durkin looks to the challenges ahead and what she'll tackle first. People are getting priced out of the city. We've got to really attack systemic racism. I think there should be a statewide income tax. I just do. And I think the thing about Seattle is that kind of indomitable spirit. Also, best-selling author Daniel James Brown on The Boys in the Boat and what's next on tap. I learned a lot about humility and gratitude and perseverance. The day after we sold the book to Viking Press, who published it, um, I sold the movie rights to a guy named Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> it's all coming up on Civic Cocktail. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter here with your new Seattle mayor, Jenny Durkin. Hi, Mayor Durkin. Thanks so much for joining us for your first full day on the job. The journalists here helping with the questioning, Natalie Brand of King 5 and Amy Radel, KUOW. <coughs> mayor Durkin, you have been running all over the city, uh, signing executive orders. What is the most important thing you feel that you've done in your first 24 hours? This is the... <laughs> this is, <laughs> This is the what have you done for us lately That's question. Right. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, I think the most important thing was getting out. You know, yesterday we had five different swearing ins at five parts of the city um, and really emphasizing to people that we have to, you know, government needs to get reconnected with the people. And I said time and time again in the campaign, I didn't want to have top down. I wanted to get the answers from community. And I think being out in the community and showing in the city hall will come to you is really important. And I think people should get used to it. That's the kind of mayor I want to be. And you were considering a party bus? What happened with I that? I was. I wanted a party <laughs> bus. Somehow people didn't think it was a good image. Oh, so <laughs> handlers, handlers. Um, there were some executive orders. Is there one that you could pick out to kind of share of just action you took yeah, right away, I right think off the, the bat. trio of the three executive orders I've done really set the frame for what what is important. First, the first executive order had to do with affordability. And you know, Joni, that this is really what is at the heart of what's happening in Seattle. People are getting priced out of the city. So the first executive order was to make sure and to put in place how we can get rental subsidies to people who need it the most. There's just too many people who are one paycheck away from losing their home. We want to help them. The second one we signed was to confirm our commitment to race and social justice equity and setting the city as the leader on those issues. That's so important, particularly in this growing and changing time. We've got to really attack systemic racism everywhere we can, and the city has to be a leader. And today was very fun. I was able to go to Seattle College, meet with students there who are just some of the most diverse, exuberant, intelligent people you can imagine and talk about how we're going to get free tuition for every Seattle public school graduate, which will open the door of opportunity in this city and reconnect our city with the economic opportunity here in a way that hasn't been done. I, I'm so excited about that one. And that's not a very expensive, I mean, it's not a very expensive project. You have the money within the budget to we, do that. We will find that we have the money within the budget. We're going to partner with people like King County and the state legislature. There's people working on this from several different angles to make sure that we really remove that barrier of costs from our students because the data is clear. You give kids that opportunity and it, and it gives them an opportunity of their lives to really have economic stability, which is what we want. So you touched on this a little bit, but Amazon and its attendant growth have reshaped this city perhaps more than the great fire of 1889. Um, the company has brought what some folks have called a prosperity bomb. Could you imagine bomb. what the underground Seattle today would look like? Though? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would be really hard to get under there. Um, uh, but it has brought a prosperity bomb, but also a lot of Seattleites feel left behind. How is how can you, as mayor, uh, manage this phenomenon to make sure that everyone feels they have a place to live here? You know, I think that's exactly right. And I talked about Bertha Landis, who was, you know, the first mayor, and her, her whole thing was make Seattle a bigger home. Um, and if you think about that today, it's really true. Is there so many people, I heard it in the last six months in every part of the city, they feel there's no place left for them here. They wonder whether there's a place for their kids. They've either been priced out or left out. And so we have to close that gap. I think we can do it. I think, you know, we're seeing that more and more in urban areas. And I think Seattle has the ability because we have the most generous people who live here. I mean, how many people voted for taxes? You know, we tax ourselves for everything. 
because we believe in it. And so if we connect that kind of enthusiasm with the goals, I have every confidence Seattle can tackle these problems. So it's day one. Where does your anxiety lie and come from? What are you nervous about? I would say the thing that you can never prepare for is the thing that makes you most anxious. And that for me is, of course, you know, earthquake. We all think about the earthquake. And so one of the first briefings I had was from our emergency management people, just to make sure that we were keeping pace and knowing what we're doing. Everyone should feel good. We do have one of the best programs in place. But it's scary. You know, Seattle has really aging infrastructure. And if we have a significant earthquake, a lot of people, if those bridges come down and the like, people will be trapped where they live. And so making sure we have the ability to get to people in one of those times of crisis, those are the things that you think, OK, that's completely outside of your control. There you go. Uh, one of the big issues during the campaign with Carrie Moon had to do with international buyers of Seattle real estate. On a couple of days after the election, the only reason I would go back to a campaign um, topic here, a couple of days after the election, the Seattle Times reported that indeed uh, a lot of international buyers, and yes, many of them were from China, are buying Seattle property as investment and not living in it. Is there something uh, you as mayor want to do about that? I think we have to look at every issue, but my reading of that article was the ones that weren't living in it were they were renting them out. And so that was housing stock that was available for our rental market. It wasn't that they were being left vacant. So there's still no data that shows that speculation is what's driving our market. What's driving our market is we have you know, almost 2,000 people moving here a week. And a lot of them are being paid lots of money. And housing stock, we have a limited supply. And so that's pushing it up. It's a supply and demand. But we have, I think, you know, one of the other briefings I've gotten is, you know, where are we on producing low-income housing? When are we going to bring it on board so people have it? And middle-class housing and apartments. We will have a huge increase in the number of units available at all ends of the spectrum. Not enough in lower income and middle income. But I think we can start to see a shift. OK. Um, during the recent uh, budget discussions, this city council here that came very close to passing a head tax, an employee tax, an Amazon tax, call it whatever you want. Uh, a Joni tax. A Joni tax. Uh, and, and many, several of the council members said they would bring this back possibly in March. You were heavily supported in the campaign by business. Would you entertain a veto if the city council did bring that back and try to pass that? You know, I think we're you getting. You always mentioned yeah. vetoes in the honeymoon. That's, when, uh, that's how you make the honeymoon work. That's why I've never been on a honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just hate that. Um, you know, I really think, you know, there are so many conversations that have to happen before then. I think we really have to look at number one, what I said is what resources do we need and where? Before we talk having more taxes, let's make sure that we know what we have and where. And so I really want to sit down with people that are doing all the homeless provision, see what we need, where the money. I believe, you know, and I don't have the data yet, but I said it throughout the campaign. You know, what I've seen tells me where we need more resources is in mental health and addiction services. And that's going to be a conversation that isn't just City of Seattle and head tax. That's got to be regional and it's got to be state because that is a problem that doesn't stop at the border. Well, King, King, King County was talking about a piece of that, which was uh, trying to find a way to uh, make sure that appointments for folks with mental illness and with addiction problems happen quicker because people reach a moment in, the, in time when they're ready <laughs> To, to make that appointment, but then they're told you can't come in for X number of weeks. Is the city going to be involved in that? The county seem to be working Absolutely. pretty hard on that. Absolutely, and I think that. that you're, you know, I don't think there's anyone in this room who probably hasn't been touched by someone who's had a problem with addiction. And you know there's that moment in time if someone really wants to get help, if you don't get them that help immediately, you may not get it again, or you may not get it for a while. And right now, we just don't have the resources to give the help to the people that need it. And if you have that kind of waiting list for people that need it, it doesn't work. So we really have to explore. I've actually been talking to our federal delegation as well to see, you know, the opiate problem is a problem in, everywhere in this country. And every one of those congressmen is up for re-election. And so I'm hoping that they see the, the wisdom in seeing, you know, we have to step up and really help across the country on this. And if so, I want Seattle at the front of the queue to say, we're here, we're going to show you how to implement it. So let's pull out the homelessness part of this for a second here and talk about, you know, the way that we spend money or the money that we spend. So 
every budget uh, for the last many years has increased the spending on homelessness, and yet every year it seems that more people are living outside. Is money the answer? We have to, it's a combination of things. We have to have the right resources and the right amount of resources. But one of the things we don't talk about much is prevention, for example. And when you have an economy like ours that has grown so quickly and then affordability is a problem, every time rent goes up $100, the data is clear, people fall into homelessness. And so even though we've housed more people, more people are becoming and experiencing homelessness. So we have to not look just at how do we house the people who are living on the street, we really have to look, how do we make sure that we protect those people who are really living on the margins, which is what my executive order yesterday was all about, those rental subsidies. It's urgent action today for people who need it to prevent them from becoming homeless itself. And so it's not just resources. Yes, resources are incredibly important, but the strategies we employ have to be different and have to be more holistic. Well, two parts of that. Um, so the rental vouchers, how much do folks get and how do they go about getting it? It, and, it's and, gonna, know, sort of what part of your life are you at that you need that and, and you can come to the city? Yeah, what, what, what happens is, and you saw it, it happens great often with people who are in fixed incomes, but the measure is how big is the rent burden? Ideally, no one should spend more than about 30% of their income on rent. And any more of that is considered to be rent burdened. In Seattle, more than half the people are what's considered rent burdened, and a significant number of people spend a lot of money. You know, I met this one woman in a senior center down in South Seattle, and she gets about $1,200 a month fixed income, but she spends almost $900 a month on rent. Um, figure that out. That's what she has for the rest of her life, for food, for medicine, for anything. So why she's at that senior center every day having lunch there, reduced lunch. we got to help people like that so that we make sure we take care of them. Uh, also, the city change, is changing the way that it picks some of the service providers for the homeless. There was um, a lot of news about that this week. Uh, and I'm wondering that if they change the way they rebid some of the contracts, some of the, the longtime service providers were either reduced or cut out. Uh, how will the changes that the city has already made, you know, before you took this office, actually reduce the number of people living outside? You know, we have to look at those numbers. I haven't seen the contracts themselves, and we'll be in the process of, now that the bid have been doing, we have to actually get the contracts in place. And so the one thing that's really important is to make sure that we don't have a gap where more people end up on the street. And that's what we have to protect against. And Mayor Burgess, former Mayor Burgess, was very careful to make sure that there's bridge funding available, to make sure that we are not, as we move from this from to having clear, that's not for bridges that's too. that's not for bridges it's to, to close the gap that's right and it's to make it so you know we the ideal is is we have to spend less money on short-term shelter which is not really a home and more money on permanent housing and so as we make that shift we have to also be careful that it's reduced the number of shelter beds that there really aren't reducing the capacity for people to have somewhere but to live. But you're on board with the changes that were made that were announced, right? I, I have not reviewed all of those changes in the last 24 hours. Um, Why not? But I'm on it. I am so on it. Um, but we will make sure, you know, we have, we have meetings set up and briefings set up to see where we are because we've got to sign the contracts. So the only thing that's been announced is who has won the RFPs. Now we've got to figure out how those contracts get signed and do an evaluation of making sure that we're not reducing the number of beds for people. And so RFPs are requests for proposal. That's uh, right. City that. budget talk. I'd also like to invite the audience if you want to uh, line up for questions. We're going to bring in uh, Amy Radel. Hi. Um, I have a question about police accountability. Um, after the consent decree that you helped negotiate, I know Seattle has put a lot of effort into creating the force investigation team in the department and having an ins a new inspector general and all of this work kind of in the city. But now I hear family members of people who were killed by police saying what they would like to see is an outside agency come in to investigate. When that happens, they'd have more trust in that process. And they're even supporting a ballot measure possibly to require that. So I just wondered what your approach which is going to be. We looked very carefully at having uh, requiring an outside force to do the reviews of Seattle Police Department when we did the consent decree. One of the issues we ran into is unlike the other police departments in the state, 
It is a very different police department in the size and scope of the urban setting. There's really no other city like Seattle for policing in Washington State. And so finding that agency that has the experience for the urban setting for a police force of this size was difficult. I think it's something we can come back and look at. But knowing how the force investigation teams work, I'm confident right now that they have the level of independence they need particularly for the next at least two to three years because the federal monitor oversees it and the federal judge requires reports. So there is a high level of scrutiny of those investigations. So, but it's something we have to keep looking at. The thing that's really important about police reform is you don't get a system and stop. You have to get a system and see how it works. But as cities change, as policing change, as community change, you have to keep current with that and make sure that what you're doing is keeping accountability and restoring that trust between community and police, which is so important both for the communities and for the police officers so that they can do their job better. Follow up on policing. Uh, Chief O'Toole was by your side all last night during your many swearing in events. Have and you I felt safer for it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you sat down with the chief? Is she planning on staying in the city of Seattle? I haven't had a time to sit down and have the long conversation with Chief O'Toole. I've said it before, I think she's been a terrific chief. She's got us to this place in reform at a place that was so critical. Um, I've said throughout the campaign, I hope that she would stay. I also know that she, you know, there's a certain time that comes in everyone's career where they feel like they've done what they need to accomplish and it's time to turn over the reins. It's like when I was U.S. Attorney, when she came in, I stepped off the stage. So I want to sit down and have a conversation fairly with her first before I make any public announcements on that. Audience question. Mayor Durkin, uh, first I'd like to uh, join you in congratulating Judge Rule in ruling the income tax invalid. And my question is, when can we expect an executive order allocating taxpayer funds to helping people learn to make personal budgets and personal finance <laughs> to make them less dependent on government? <laughs> that would be an overreach of government. <laughs> I, you know, I, think, I think it's a great question, but I think, look, we've got to, I believe that, you know, we as a city have to be very disciplined about our spending, but there's a lot of disagreement, and I think we, as a, in large, we focus on those things we care about. And as mayor, I'm going to continue to have those conversations to make sure that we're budgeting effectively, that we're thinking about how we spend the money, because the money, you know, we've been in good times, um, but I've lived in this city most of my life. And there are cycles, and we want to make sure that we have sustainable revenue sources for the things we care about most. Um, and you warned in a recent debate, I think Natalie was moderating it, uh, that downtown traffic is about to get a lot worse, and you asked people <laughs> not to blame you for that. That's right. Um, so, you, it wasn't, it wasn't the mayor's you. fault, and that I wasn't mayor yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what are your strategies or ideas about coping with that? I think we're going to have to have a whole range of strategies. Um, there is, as you know, there's the One City Center project that's been underway to kind of plan for some of these mega projects. But when we have the convention center start construction, the buses come out onto the street, First Avenue being, you know, torn up, um, it's going to be very, very difficult in the city. And so we're going to have to have a whole range of strategies, including number one, of course, getting more people on transit. We've got to get people out of single occupancy vehicles so we just have fewer cars on the street. It's just math. But to do that, we have to make sure the transit goes from where they want to get where they are and gets to where they want to be. And so we're going to have, have a lot of strategies. I've talked about wanting to work with some of the larger employers to see if they will stagger work times during the, the hardest parts of this, which will, you know, could be 18 months to two years. Um, where you can say, you know, maybe on Mondays 20% of your team works from home and on Tuesdays a different 20% so we get fewer people coming in. We got to make it more friendly for walking and biking and uh, we're going to have to have a whole range of strategies. But I think if we do it and if people know um, that they have to contribute and, and pitch in for this, you'll see behaviors change. Uh, more people will get in carpools, more people will learn about ways they can, you know, get to work somewhere other than just getting in a single occupancy vehicle. As we've been discussing, you've already signed three executive orders in your first day and a half. You have a long list of policy proposals that you talked about on the campaign trail. So how will you measure outcomes and make sure that your programs are working effectively? How long will you give certain programs? That's a really good question. I just had some conversations with people about today, and part of our implementation has to be 
some kind of feedback where we're measuring, are we getting what we think needed to happen? Um, and so I think, for example, on college tuition, likely will be phased in the way the budget will work because to scale this out across all the high schools in Seattle and the colleges will require some thought and development because the success of these programs is not just to give you know students tuition it's really to have someone in the high school the services to get them ready for college and somewhere where they land and so we want to make sure that we're effective in all these programs and see when they come back has it worked um, and so depending on what the nature of the program is, we'll have a different kind of evaluation. So with kids going to college, there'll be very good ways to measure. Did they get in? Did they stay in? Were they successful? You know, and to have those kind of studies. For other programs, we're gonna have to have different kinds of metrics. But I think you are, a very important point is, you know, more and more I heard everywhere, people are willing to step up um, and help solve these problems, tax themselves. But they want to know it's working. They want to know there's accountability. So it's going to be really important in all these programs to build that in. I want to go back to the traffic downtown and ask you, what is up with all these streetcars? Um, <laughs> so what I mean is a lot of them are empty. They take up a lot of space. And I know this didn't happen on your watch, but is this something we should revisit? We have a lot of taxpayer money going into streetcars. Does that seem like the right transportation choice? You know, I, I got this question a lot when I was during the campaign, and it was like, you know, what about First Avenue? Are we really going to tear it up? Um, and I said, you know, I'm not sure that we can revisit what's been done because you always feel like the infrastructure you have now isn't being used. But think about what we're going to be in 15 and 20 years. And we have to be thinking that 15 and 20 years from now, will we be thankful that there's some kind of streetcar that goes back and forth and people can just hop on it and get there? So you um, haven't ridden it either, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so slow. Um, I joked, I joked that I just wanted to rent out all those buses that look like streetcars, just have them drive back and forth, paint them different colors, um, and, and call it a day. Um, a coalition of local groups is planning to sue over some of the uh, up zones and the plans for growth. In some ways, this is the issue of this time. Many Seattleites still want to maintain single family neighborhoods and, and streets. What is a new mayor to do? You know, change is hard. You know, I, I was at a, a room like this and I said, okay, I want everyone in this room, be honest. How many people kind of wish we could just take a pause? We just wish we could stop growth for a little while, keep it like it is until we sort things in. Almost everybody raised their hand. Oh, yeah. And then I said, keep your hand up if you were born here. Uh, All of them came down. You know? Like two of you in the room. <laughs> I know of two And in so the room. I can tell you, for me growing up here, I, there's so many times I wish I could just roll up the welcome mat and say, stop. <laughs> Uh, do it now. <laughs> um, but, you know, we are a growing, vibrant city. And if we want to stay a growing, vibrant city, we've got to figure out how we handle the growth. Um, and that means we've got to have smart growth. And it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all for every part of this city. We've got to engage people in a more thoughtful way than we have so that they feel they're part of the solution, not just that they're being crushed by growth. So you, at the very beginning of this, asked the audience, you know, how many people around here support taxes? And, yeah, we know that they do. Uh, but you've also been critical of the use of the property tax. Voters, as we know, they say yes pretty much all the time, transportation, parks, all of that. But uh, that is part of the reason why the city is becoming less affordable. Do you think the city council and the mayor should stop asking for property tax increases? One of the really unfortunate things is we just have so few vehicles available to us, which is why the income tax was one thing. You know, I think there should be a statewide income tax. I just do. I think, I think in, until we have a more fair tax system, we'll keep going to the well that hurts the people that have the least. And that's sales tax, property tax, and B and O taxes for small businesses. You know, who are taxed on gross, not profit. And so we've got to reconfigure the whole process. But I agree with you, Joni. Do I think we have to stop going to the well? I don't think we well, can. Well, that well is what I'm yeah. speaking of. I don't think we can yet. But I tell you, I believe sticker shock is coming when the when the amount of money that for the quote McCleary fix, Absolutely. which is the Supreme Court case hits property taxes across the city, I think people are going to be really stunned because, you know, everyone keeps saying in the newspaper that it's something like $460 for the average Seattle house. Well, that average Seattle house they're using for the calculation is about $500,000. You know, show me that house, I'll buy it. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, you know, it's going to be much more than that for a lot On of people. On the east side, I think it's at least 800 to 1,000 yeah, extra. And, and for you're that. getting yeah. no more, it's no new services. So I think we really have to have a conversation with the county, with the state. We have to make this a regional conversation because we, none of these problems are isolated. You know, the homelessness doesn't stop at the city line. Opiate problems don't stop at the city line. Affordability now isn't stopping at the city line. So we have to pull together and find more regional solutions. And if we do that, we'll find more resources. So as you said, you're a native Seattleite. And um, you, you definitely know the answer to this question. Sonics. <laughs> Okay. Next, that, that could be the that is an answer for a lot of people like my son and stuff like that. But um, what do you say to the longtime Seattleites? One just called out here who say the city's losing its soul. What is its soul? You're a native. You know, I think that Seattle. We are at this point of inflection, and I think that we are we are in danger of not knowing who we are. But I have more faith in this than us. And I think it was one of the great things yesterday, being out in five different neighborhoods to take the oath and having communities come together that are as different from one another, but at the same time being all one city. And we still are that kind of city. We really believe in community, in our progressive values, in that future that's better. And I think the thing about Seattle is that kind of indomitable spirit, kind of eclectic, sometimes funky, um, and we're still going to be that way, but we've got to be intentional we do about lose, growth. As, as growth happens, we lose a lot of funky dive bars, you know, sort of non God, so the commercial. days of dive bars. Yeah, you know, that's the, <laughs> that's the thing. No, it's true, and that's why I think on this growth, going back to your other question, some of these actions that neighborhoods and others are taking are, are, are just as much about, wait a minute, who are we? as they are about that particular upzone. And so engaging people in the process and being intentional about what do we want so that every zoning and upzone, we don't end up with block after block after block with just square buildings that look like Vladivostok 60. You know, we look and think about how do we design intentional, interesting neighborhoods and still have those small businesses and affordable commercial spaces and green space. What we've lost in this new city is green space and public space and open space. And I think that's part of the thing we have to do to keep Seattle, Seattle. I had a note today in my email from Peter Jackson, and he was talking about children of politicians. And he, he described them as entitled and insecure. Um, but, but I would like what to know. What does he mean by that? I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. But I want to know, sort of, as the child of a longtime Washington State politician, how did your father impact your decision to, to you know, run I, for this office? I think growing up in a family that, you know, a, a, my father was an elected official, exposed me to things I never would have been exposed to. You know, as a kid, you know, in and out of our house were. You know, not just people who are elected officials, but you know, members of Farm Workers Union and the Black Panthers, and and seeing that kind of dynamic change and activism, and seeing it from both sides, I think was terrific. But also just having, you know, for me as much was, you know, why I can never be entitled or insecure is I'm the fifth of eight kids. You know, it may be a little insecure. You weren't sure if there was enough mashed potatoes. Um, <laughs> but, but I think you really, I think for me, it was a great way to, to have that exposure to everyone across the spectrum and see people really trying in different ways to improve the system. And noisy is OK. You know, people, you know, we had at one of the events yesterday, there was a protester. And some people were, you know, were upset. And I'm like, no, that's part of Seattle. There's nothing wrong with dissent. So we're about to interview author Daniel James Brown, so I hope you answer this question right. Um, what, what book are you Great book. What, <laughs> what What's book the name are, of it? <laughs> what book are you reading now, or what book is sitting on your nightstand waiting to be read? You know, I have, and this isn't a dodge, I have like five books. You know, people give me books like, you know, the, about great American cities and the first thing to do in the first 90 days, and I'm like, is reading the book one of the things you're supposed to do in the first you 90 can't, days? You can't have time to do you it. Know? And so I turn to, it's really a, a mood thing, and I have to admit, I read really bad spy books. OK. <laughs> we have been talking with Seattle's new mayor, Jenny Durkin, and we're coming right back to Yay. chat with Boys in the Boat author, Daniel James Bond. Thank you.
are back with Daniel James Brown, author of this fantastic book, The Boys in the Boat. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Daniel, I'm assuming many people in this vigorous crowd here this evening have read The Boys in the Boat, but for those who haven't, can you give us the quickie elevator speech version of the plot? Uh, the elevator plot. Yeah. A bunch of ragtag kids from western Washington against all odds um, fight their way through the elite uh, rowing programs of the East Coast and wind up going to um, um, Berlin in 1936 to row against a German boat, amongst others. Uh, there for were six boats, weren't there? There were six boats. <laughs> uh, uh, but amongst those were the German and Italian boats, the two fascist powers. And uh, these kids from Western Washington wind up winning the gold medal in a very dramatic come from behind fashion. Um, there's a few patriots in the room. Uh, part of the appeal of the book, as you referred to, the ragtag, uh, these boys in this boat were, many of them were middle or even low income kids. Yeah. And so part of the appeal of the book, I wonder if you agree with this, um, has that sort of underdog feel. They, they, they didn't have a lot that they were looking sure. forward to in their lives, but here's this moment. Yeah. How much do you think that uh, drove the popularity of your book? Well, it is, it is sort of a classic uh, you know, American underdog story. These were kids that grew up in mill towns and logging camps uh, around western Washington. They grew strong mostly wielding pitchforks and axes and um, digging ditches and cutting down trees. They worked in shipyards. Um, they were the kinds of kids that um, represented sort of um, the, the best hearty stock of the state of Washington in the 1930s. And part of what's so interesting about them is that to get where they ultimately got to those Olympics in Berlin, they had to go up against and defeat these kids from the East Coast first, kids who had learned to row in prep schools, kids who were the sons of titans of industry and U.S. senators and even presidents of the United States. FDR had two boys rowing at the time. Those are the kinds of young men that rowed for the Eastern schools by and large in the 1930s. You know, I was struck when I saw the pictures of the boys in the boat, how thin they were. You say they were strong. Yeah. They looked like they hadn't eaten in years. Some, yeah, of, them. And some, of, them, <laughs> some of them hadn't. Um, uh, they had, they were, at the very least, they were having a very hard time putting a couple square meals in front of themselves on any given day. They were burning extraordinary amounts of calorie, calories. Rowing is just an incredibly demanding sport So physically. How, much, how many calories do you always see at, at like Starbucks or wherever, you need 2,000 calories a day. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how many calories they were? Uh, I don't know. How, I don't know how many calories, but I know that the average weight of the that crew was something like 175 pounds, oh. although they were all over six feet. Uh, the average weight of a collegiate crew now is well over 200 pounds. Uh, kids that row these days um, for UW or any other you know collegiate program. They're big, bulky people, both the men and the women. They're well nourished. They're very, very. Um, their diets are, are are carefully thought out. These kids and the boys in the boat, as I say, they were they were just grateful to get a hot dog for lunch and you know a can of beans for dinner. So they they were bean poles. So Joe Rance, one of the leading characters of the book, from Swim, but also from Spokane. Um, how much did your living near his daughter have to do with you being the author of this book? Uh, the, the book would not have happened but for that. Um, Tell us that story if you can. So uh, I guess it was about eight years ago now. My neighbor, uh, a lady I knew at the time only as Judy, came to me after a homeowners association meeting. And, um, and she introduced herself to me. And um, she said that she was reading my first book to her dad. And he was really enjoying that book. But he was living under hospice care at her home. And he wanted to meet me. So she asked if I would come down to meet her dad. And I went down the next day, I think it was, and I met this elderly gentleman named Joe Rance. And Joe, um, first of all, he started talking about his personal experiences growing up during the Great Depression. And if you've read the book, you know he had this very, very difficult family situation oh, to overcome. Oh, that's the worst I've ever read, just basically. Hor just horrific. He was basically abandoned by his parents, treated as if he was disposable, left to fend for himself when he was 14 years old. 
So Joe told me all this, and that in itself really got to me. But then uh, Judy, his daughter, started steering the conversation towards her dad's experiences growing up. I mean, uh, after that, towards her dad's experiences rowing uh, for a crew at the UW and how he and his crewmates had come together starting in the fall of 1933 and then wound up rowing in Berlin in 1936 and, and winning this gold medal. And you know, as Joe was telling me this story, it just absolutely took my breath away. And, and I noticed as he was talking that he was tearing up a lot. And he was tearing up whenever he talked about any of these other uh, young men who had rowed with him. So I knew there was a lot of heart there. And I really- Well, how old was he when you met him? What, I mean, he was in his 90s. He was I 92, see. something like that, when I met him. And he, there were only two guys left from that original crew. Oh. And Joe, as it turned out, only had a couple months to live. So he was near the end of his road. Um, but he was very emotional about the story. Do you think it was because he was pouring out these details to, I, I, to you? I, at or? first, I thought it was, he was sad. Most of his, he was telling about these other guys, and most of them had passed away in the preceding few years. But I could also see there was a lot of pride coming through in those tears. And, um, and so I'll never forget, because at the end of the conversation, usually I'm really picky about book topics, but at the end of the conversation, I just sort of blurted out. I said, Joe, can I write a book about your life? And um, I'll never forget this, because he said no. Oh! And sh he shook his head, and he looked down at his feet, no. And my heart sank. But then he looked up, and he had those tears in his eyes again. And he said, and he sort of croaked out, he said, but you could write a book about the boat. And I didn't oh, know what he meant at oh, first. Oh, he thought you were just going to yeah, purely he, focus well, about on him. him. And right. it had to be about the boat. And by the boat, of course, he meant all the guys. what all of them had you know, what all of them had done together, but, but something more than that, what they had all become together that summer, 75 years before, this almost perfect living, breathing thing that a really great crew is. And when he said that, and I finally comprehended what he meant, I was just absolutely committed 100% to trying to, to do it and to do it as well as I could. You did a nice job. How much time would you say you spent with Joe to get, now that he's, now that he's saying, oh, okay, if it's about yeah. the whole collective yeah. experience, yeah. Uh, how much time did you spend with him? I mean, were you sitting there you know, taping and yeah, transcribing I, furiously, or how just, much were you able to get out of him? Well, he was, he was getting weaker day by day um, because of his condition, and so I interviewed him a number of times. I don't remember how many times exactly, but by the end of a couple of months, um, I, I really didn't feel good about interviewing him anymore because he was just too, too weak and it was becoming a burden. Um, but what really saved the day was that his daughter Judy had, um, had wanted a book written about her dad's story and she had thought maybe she'd write one herself or try to find a writer who, who could do it. Which is why she invited me down to meet her dad Ooh. that day, oh, so she's, uh, <laughs> which I didn't understand at first. But, uh, and she later said, you know. Yeah. But, um, but what saved the day was that uh, Judy had saved notebook after notebook after notebook. She had, she had followed her dad around with a pad of paper and a pencil, basically, for the last five years of his life, asking him just incredibly detailed questions about, you know, that night your family abandoned you out in squim. What was the weather like? What kind of food was in the house? Well, what if you could thinking? stop there for a second. The night his family abandoned him in Squim is one of the most haunting things I've ever read in a book about anything. I, I wish, tell us about what the weather was like. And, <laughs> and for folks who didn't read it, that, that yeah. moment is just, it's what you'll never forget. Yeah, so this kid's 14 years old. He's already had uh, sort of been thrown out of the house by his stepmother several times before. But he comes home from school one day. Um, it's a rainy day. He comes home from school, the bus drops him off. He's walking up this long driveway towards this half-finished house that his father was building out in Squim. And, um, and the car's in the front yard, and it's idling. And all the family's possessions are piled on top of the car or in the car. Uh, the family's in the car. Joe walks up and, and says, well, what's happening? Where are we going? And, and his dad says, well, we can't make it here. We're going we're gonna to go someplace else. But the thing is, Joe, 
Thula, your stepmom doesn't want you to go with us. And so they get in the car and they drive away and Joe is left standing there on the porch of this house in the rain, 14 years old. And no provisions are left for him? There was or some bologna plans? and there, there was, you know, was a little bit of food in the fridge at the house. No provisions, no plans. So he spends the next several years of his life basically foraging in the woods for berries and uh, poaching salmon out of the Dungeness River and selling bootleg liquor that he stores. He st would steal the liquor from a bootlegger <laughs> <laughs> and then resell it to his own clientele. Um, Which is with a little slight markup. Or something. <laughs> with a little markup. A little. Yeah. So. Well, that explains because uh, when you and I met earlier, you said that when you were in the process of getting the information for the book and when you were writing the book, that you and Judy Rance cried, quote, gallons of tears. Gallons and gallons. Were you crying or was she crying? Was a, there, whole there, I may have shed a, a few tears, too. I mean, it was a very affecting story, but mostly it was Judy. Judy is so devoted to her father and to her father's memory. It was very hard for her, even 75 years after the fact, to talk about that day when he was abandoned and some of the other things that happened to him. As well. So just, yeah. Audience, if you would like to join us, come to where the mic runner is, uh, and I'll bring in the journalist, Natalie. I've really enjoyed your book, so thank you for writing it. Uh, Joe Rance really embodies Western and Pacific Northwestern grit and resilience. So in researching for your book, what are some of the biggest lessons that he taught you? Uh, boy, I learned a lot from Joe Rance. I mean, I learned a lot about humility and gratitude and perseverance and all these sort of um, character values that he embodied. Um, I, think, I think one of the most important of those is maybe one of the least obvious, which is what, is what I just mentioned, was humility. You know, Joe. Joe had an ability, even like when he got that gold medal, when he came home with a gold medal, like a lot of the other guys on this crew, he put it in a box and put it up in the attic and went out and tried to find a job to get through another year of school and hardly ever mentioned having won a gold medal. And this was typical of, of all these guys on this crew. They, and I think it was true of that generation by and large. There was a kind of civility and a kind of humility that they valued, that they embodied, that they, they lived their lives by, where boasting about one's accomplishments wasn't the first thing that they, they thought of. And um, so, I, you know, as I say, I think there's a lot of sort of character uh, traits that I've come to admire in not just Joe, but all these characters that I you know, try to incorporate into my own life. Can I ask a question over here? Uh, need need the mic to be with you. Can you go around and come this way? Oh, well, go in front. Whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever route gets you there. There's the mic runner. <laughs> Can I ask how we got from there to the UW? How we got from how, how he got from the from oh. there to the UW rowing team. I mean, that's kind of a far stretch. Yeah. So uh, Joe was, um, because he worked uh, physically so hard, uh, in addition to stealing the uh, bootleg liquor, liquor <laughs> he also uh, found employment digging ditches and um, dynamiting stumps out of um, farmland and doing hard physical work. By the time he was in high school, he was very strong. He had very great upper body strength. And um, uh, he, he wound up going to Roosevelt High here in Seattle um, as his brother invited him to come live in Seattle and go to Roosevelt because Roosevelt was an accredited high school unlike Squim High. Oh. And his, father, his brother thought that if you go to an accredited school, maybe you'll be able to get into the university. But as it happened, um, Coach Al Ulbrichson made a habit of scouting Roosevelt and other oh. high schools looking for tall, strong young men. And he happened to walk by gym class one day when uh, Joe got into gymnastics. And he saw Jim on the, I mean, Joe on the um, parallel bars, I guess it was. And he took one look at him and, uh, and got him a card that, and said, come down and uh, see me at the beginning of the fall semester. I think maybe we can use you on our crew. 
and so it, that's what started it for him. The crew got him into the University of Washington. So the there. crew got him into yeah. the University of Washington, and also um, it was necessary for Joe to stay on the crew in order to stay at the university. There were no scholarships for rowing uh, at the University of Washington at the time. But if you were in good standing on the crew, they would guarantee you a part-time job somewhere on campus. And Joe, that, Joe really needed that job. He had almost no savings. And so by staying on the crew, he could maintain the job at UW and thereby stay in school. So this book is expected to become a movie, but you're in a slight I like the way the eyes are going. You're in a slight Hollywood tangle. Can a little you bit of a tangle. That? Yeah. So yeah, the day the day after we sold the book to Viking Press, who published it, um, I sold the movie rights to a guy named Harvey Weinstein. I was going for the laugh there. I really was. Um. About whom I knew nothing. Um, <laughs> That the reason I actually had choice of several uh, movie companies and producers. Uh, okay. I didn't know anything about any of them. But two nights before that, my wife Sharon and I had been watching the Academy Awards, and um, the Weinstein Company had won Oscar after Oscar after Oscar for The King's Speech. So I said, "Well, I know that guy. He makes he makes Oscar <laughs> Oscar winning films." So we sold it to the Weinstein Company year, several years ago. Um, and um, since then, um, they've, they've developed some scripts and really basically haven't done much more than that. And I've been getting more and more frustrated. Now, given the way things have turned out, I'm very anxious to remove the project from the Weinstein Company. Yeah, how do you get out of it? You know, well, the we'll company see. probably goes, goes down. It, it's going to depend on what happens so. to the company. I mean, um, very likely the company will go bankrupt. Right. If it doesn't go bankrupt, we will see to it that the project is sold to a different studio. I do not want my How long will you be in this? In this uh, we don't know. I was just talking to my agent today about it, actually. It could be weeks or it could be a couple months for things to settle out. It may be, it may be that some other entity buys the company intact. Um, there was a proposal. There have been a couple of groups of um, mostly women investors who've come forward. Uh, there's something perfect about that, Well, right? there's something very perfect about that. <laughs> the, the, the idea, actually, that both these groups have is to, um, to buy the company, to put a, um, a, an all-female or mostly female board in place, and then to take profits from the company and cycle them back either into compensating Harvey's victims or into other related um, causes. But now, I mean, whether your goal that's is to happen, get separate from, from So that. I don't, if that happened, I'd be glad to stay there. I mean, I if they rebrand the company and it has that kind of, you know, that's the purpose of the company, that's the point of the company, then I'd be glad to stay there. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, I would like to see it moved somewhere else. Um, your book has such a sense of place. I mean, I can you know, picture all the sequences where they're out on Lake Washington and they're at the boathouse at the UW. And um, someone told me that if the movie's made, it might not be filmed here. I just wondered if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, again, a lot of people, um, Jeannie Cole Wells uh, amongst them, have been very active in trying to um, get the film made here. I would love to see the film made here. Um, Given its current status, there's just no way to know. If a different studio picks it up, then we will begin to lobby them to have the film made here. It why would really they be. make it here? Why wouldn't they make it here? Yeah. For tax reasons. Uh, Washington State doesn't have particularly attractive uh, tax incentives for film production. Last I checked, it was like three million or something. Uh, yeah, I think that we're willing to check, put three million in. The, British Columbia, for instance, has very attractive uh, tax incentives. A lot of other states do. Various foreign countries have much more attractive tax incentives. So unless Washington State steps forward and um, creates such incentives, it's going to be a stretch to get whoever ultimately makes the film to, to do it here. So a lot of people in this room want to know what your next book is, what you're working on right now. You have another. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm just getting to work on a book that is going to track the lives of several um, young uh, Japanese-American um, men and their families, at the, starting with the beginning of World War II and going through to the end of the war. Some of these are guys that were interned. Some of them are guys that resisted internment. Some of them fought in the US military. 
they all have interesting stories. So I want to actually start with the immigrant stories of their parents and, uh, and then carry through the war years. And I'm, I think it's going to be a big epic story that um, I think will have a lot are, of relevance. Are you fairly far along or just beginning? No, or no just, just beginning. I'm still doing interviews uh, and will be for the next few months. But, uh, but I've got a, a pretty clear vision of what I want to do at this point. Audience. Hi. Thank you for coming to talk to us tonight. Your book left such an impression on me. I was really looking forward to hearing you speak. Um, and truly, every story of the boys on the crew were remarkable. And Joe at the top of the list. But there are other cast of characters that stick in my mind. The reporter from the local newspaper, both the coach and the assistant coach. And I wondered if you had an opportunity to speak to anybody else that was in the periphery or was in Germany or in uh, New England when the boys were rowing to get the honor to go to the Olympics. People that saw them and, and, and because it just, the, everything was so rich about the relationships between the people in the city, the boys and their families, between the boys themselves and their families and the school and, yeah. you know, it just seemed like you had a lot of source material to work with. I did, uh, partly because I spent uh, about four years researching the book. Um, it was a long research project, but so all kinds of people helped. Um, Family members from all nine families came to me with boxes of diaries and letters and news clippings and sat down with me for many, many hours of interviews about dad or granddad, as the case might be. Uh, one of the interesting peripheral characters was George Pocock, the boat builder. Yeah. That was a particularly interesting guy. Uh, George had passed on a number of years before, but uh, George's son, Stan, was still alive when I was writing the book. And Stan spent a lot of time with me talking about his dad, talking about the craft of building uh, wooden shells, um, and gave me access to his dad's uh, papers. It was, I was also blessed in this project in that um, that era, the 30s and 40s, was uh, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, was sort of a golden era of sports writing. So there was wonderful reportage on these races. I mean, not just on the races, but for days leading up to one of these races, there would be stories about this coach is thinking this, this coxswain has a sore throat, just all this color, <laughs> this very, very colorful sports writing. So I had you know, just wonderful resources to work with there, too. Uh, I bet a lot of folks don't know about your first book. You mentioned it here at the very beginning. What was that about? And that, again, was historical, and you sort of knew that story through your family. Yeah. Um, first book is called Under a Flaming Sky, and uh, it's about a forest fire in Minnesota in 1894. And actually what happened was two forest fires converged on this little logging town of Hinckley, Minnesota on a very dry, hot, windy September day. And my great-grandfather and his family had emigrated from Norway. He was working at a lumber mill in, in Hinckley uh, that day. The family had settled in town. As these fires converged on the town, they, they basically surrounded the town. They trapped the whole population of the town. So a great many things happened. But they tried to evacuate the town by backing two trains out of town on two different uh, railroads. Uh, the first train they backed out of town made it over a trestle just before the trestle collapsed. Um, the underpinnings had all burned away. The other train, my uh, great-grandmother and her son, my grandfather, climbed onto that train. That train started to back out of town, and it caught fire. And by the time it had gone five miles outside of town, it was on fire from one end to the other. The top of the carriages was on fire. So it had to come to a stop. It came to a stop uh, in sort of a low, boggy area. Everybody that piled off one side of the, plane, the train died. Everybody that uh, piled off the other side, there was a little bit of a swamp there. So my great-grandmother and my grandfather um, immersed themselves in the water and, and survived um, as the fire went over them by staying in the water. And my great-grandfather uh, all the mill hands were sent to the south end of town to fight the fire, and, and all of them died. So my great-grandfather actually died in the fire. But anyway, there were, it, was, it was quite an amazing event, and there were a lot, of, um, a lot of very heroic things that people did that day. 
aside from running into all these amazing stories that you do, any hints for the writers in the room? What kind of a writer are you? A morning writer, an evening writer, a procrastinator? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody should emulate my writing process. I mean, but if they wanted to, what, no. what would be a good takeaway? Uh, make it chaotic. Um, <laughs> I, um, I mean, I have certainly learned some things as I've written each book. I'm not very disciplined. Um, but I have found that certain things work for me. So I work best in the morning and then uh, very late at night, like 10 or 11 at night. Sometimes I'll get a second wind and write uh, late at night. So that works for me. I think it's really important to find your own groove, just sort of find what works for you. It's going to be different. Different people are going to find that different things work. Um, I spend a lot of time doing research before I write very, very detailed research. So I think a, a book like The Boys in the Boat, I think of it in terms of scenes. First, I spend a lot of time just getting the overall arc of the story. So I might spend a year just understanding the arc of the story. But once I understand the big arc, I go back and I start writing scene one, scene two, scene three, and just work my way chronologically through the book. But what I do is, Scene one in The Boys in the Boat is Joe Rance and Roger Morris uh, go together from the engineering department down to the crew house to turn out for crew on the first day of rowing in 1933. So I knew that was going to be the first scene. What I did to write that scene is typical. Uh, knowing that that's the scene I needed to create, I talked to Joe, I talked to Roger, who was still alive, about their memories of that day. Then I went to the uh, to Suzilo Library, and I found uh, photographs taken on campus that week. And I saw that there was a lawn out in front of Suzilo Library. Red Square wasn't there. It was all grass. Oh. And all these students were sitting around um, on blankets, um, smoking cigarettes. The men and the women are both smoking cigarettes almost universally. And they're all reading newspapers. So I went and got the newspapers for that day. I think it was October 5th, 1933. And I read those, the Seattle Times, the PI, and the Daily, read them cover to cover, to see what are they reading about, what's happening in Seattle that day, found the weather for that day. So what I do is I do this very intensive research on that scene, and I get to the point eventually where if I don't write that scene down, I am afraid I'm going to lose it. Yeah. And this usually happens at some inconvenient time when I'm in the shower or I'm mowing the lawn or something like that. But I get to the point, I, I got to write this down. I'm going to lose it if I don't write it down. So I dash to the computer. I just sort of splat it down, write it Just quickly. to have it. It's good to have just it to somewhere. Capture, just to right. capture Live it. Live somewhere. Right. And then I'll go on and work on the next scene, the next scene. But then I will come back to that first scene a week or two later and um, pull it out of the drawer and look at it. And I always see things that are you know, catastrophically wrong with it or things, <laughs> you know, things that could be done much better. And so I just get in this iterative sort of process. Well, I thank you. Uh, we, are, we are out of time. We have been talking with author Daniel James Brown. We're going to take a holiday break and return in February with former Interior Secretary Sally Jewell. Happy holidays, and thanks so much for watching. Thank you, Daniel.